And I think, um, Iris, after your presentation, we're going to have lots of time for questions. So it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Iris, Iris Sufi. She's a system professor in hematology and a lymphoma specialist and transplanter par excellence. And I think after amazing teamwork and a lot, a lot of work in around 2018, Iris and the team um, launched the CAR T cell program and we'll be hearing about the present and the future. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our work over the last uh, one year. So I have, these are my disclosures. I won't be discussing any off-label use of products. Uh, so just to, uh, to start the talk, I'd give, like to give you a short background on the landscape of CAR T-cell therapy. Then I will discuss some of the commercially available CAR T-cell products we have, what the similarities and differences are between them. And then I will introduce to you our program here at Yale. I'll provide an overview of the components that are needed for effective management of patients receiving immune effector cell therapy, the regulatory oversight uh, that's necessary. And then I will present the outcome data on patients we've treated here with commercial products. I would also like to introduce to you the newly created immune effector cell therapy DART. Uh, I will present the portfolio of clinical trials uh, that we have. And then finally, I'd like to end by discussing some future developments in the CAR-T field, which I find very exciting. So this is the total number of registered CAR-T cell trials worldwide. And as you can see, there's been an explosion in the field of CAR-T cell therapy. Um, especially in the last four to five years with currently almost 250 CAR-T clinical trials, um, most of them being done in the United States and China, but also Europe. And mm -hmm. since about 2016, industry has really taken over the conduct of, this, of these clinical trials. And these have, has to do with uh, all the manufacturing costs, the development of new technologies, and large-scale production that's necessary. So how did these car designs evolve over time? We started with first-generation cars with an antigen recognition domain and one singling uh, domain consisting of CD3 zeta. These cells had killing ability, but they not multiply and persist very long. And then we developed second and third generation cars that in addition to CD3 Zeta contained signal 2, either 41BB or CD28 co-stimulatory domain, which gave them the ability to multiply secrete cytokines and persist. The second generation cars are uh, currently in late phase clinical trials and what's actually on the market. Since my uh, clinical interest is in lymphoma. I will just illustrate with some of the trials and results that we have achieved in lymphoma treatment. So these are the three major anti-CD19 CAR T-cell products for lymphoid malignancies. Exicaptogen Cylolucil, evaluated in early phase ZUMA1 clinical trial, Tisagen Liclusil in Juliet, and Lysocaptogen Myelusil in Transcend. The first two products are currently on the market as of 2017, and the last is not yet FDA approved. They have several differences that I've outlined on the left. So the construct is different. Some of them use CD28 as the co-stimulatory domain and some for 1BB. The type of viral vector is different, retroviral versus lentiviral. Uh, the last product on the right actually de uh, delivers the cells in a one-to-one -one CD4 to CD8 ratio. The dose of the T, -cell given, T cells given was different between trials. Exicaptogen cytolucil trials did not allow any bridging therapy for the patients, whereas the other two trials, most of the patients had received some sort of bridging therapy. The lymphodepletion that they received before CAR T cells was mostly consisting of fludarabine cytoxin, but the doses used were different. ZUMA1 trial allowed inpatient only administration of these cells, and that's how it was approved, whereas the other two uh, trials allowed both inpatient and outpatient administration. So just uh, since I mentioned the CD4 to CD8 CAR-T uh, ratio uh, and why that might be important, 
uh, it is important to have less vari variability in the final product specifications. And the purer the T cells that are delivered, the better the expansion. However, this process is actually very costly. Um, you have to uh, develop two cultures in parallel using several cytokines. And when this product actually comes on the market, there may be a higher than expected rate of out of spec products. So how does this affect outcomes? These are patients with very aggressive relapse refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. They had failed multiple lines of treatment. More than half of these patients had already progressed after an autologous transplant, and their two-year overall survival was expected to be less than 10%. So if we look, uh, if we take into account just the most aggressive histologies, you can see that the best overall response rate there is between 40 and 80% with a best complete response rate of 40 to 62% and a six month complete response rate in these patients anywhere between 30 and 46%. Again, this was unthought of before the era of CAR T cell therapy. And important to outline is that data from both Zuma1 and Juliet shows that patients who achieve remission at the three month mark, and especially the patients who may maintain their remission status at six months, uh, may be cured. What about the toxicities? The main types of toxicities we see in these patients are cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. And as you can see, really grade three or four cytokine release syndrome was seen in 11%, 23 and 1% of patients with these products. And grade three and above neurotoxicity, which is actually more common in lymphoma patients, was anywhere between 12 to 32%. The cytokine release syndrome is typically treated with tocilizumab plus steroids, whereas neurotoxicity typically treated with steroids. Importantly, these trials use different toxicity grading scales, and there are a lot of caveats in cross-trial comparisons because different eligibility criteria were used, and the, even the dose levels of the T-cells, as I mentioned in the previous slides, was different. So Tisagen Leclusel and Axicaptogen Silolusel, both targeting CD19, are approved and on the market since 2017. Tisagen Leclusel also treats B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It's the only product currently approved for that indication up until the age of 25. And axicantogen Silolusel, in addition to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and transformed follicular lymphoma, is also approved for primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. This year, we expect approval of the third pro product, Lysocaptogen Myalusel, in lymphoma and also very exciting, an anti-BCMA CAR T in multiple myeloma, idacaptogen beclusel. The FDA issued a statement in January of 2019 that by 2020, they expect to receive over 200 INDs per year. And by 2025, they will be approving 10 to 20 cell and gene therapy products per year. And they base that estimate on the current pipeline and the success rates that are being seen. So how do we select between these products? Well, there are product-specific characteristics and also patient and center considerations. So manufacturing is different. The co-stimulatory domain is different. The cell dose is different. The vein-to-vein -vein type is different, anywhere uh, from 17 days to over a month. The type and dose of lymphodepletion used is different, the incidence and severity of toxicities, and inpatient versus outpatient administration. As far as patient and center considerations, we need to take into account how sick the patient is and how quickly does he or she need the product, what their age, fitness, and comorbidities are, and what the actual center has access to. Does the center have access to all the commercially available products or not? What is the center's clinical trial availability? Is there an ability for outpatient administration? And what is the cost and reimbursement going to look like for the different products? So how did we build our team here at Yale? Well, we started very small. So 
Lisa Barbarota was a program manager and oncology nursing education and practice, and Kimberly Severino, who's now Smilo Performance Manager, were actually our first administrative champions who laid the foundation for the program. We realized that we had to develop orga an organizational structure. We needed to train and educate staff. We had to look at our operational capabilities in the inpatient, outpatient setting, in the MICU and ECC. We had to develop a specific budget for CAR T cell therapy, and we also had to comply with the regulatory oversight. So we developed the steering committee to oversee the safety and progress of the CAR T trials and to address any major operational and financial issues, as well as to make key decisions uh, and provide oversight to three subcommittees. That was the protocol review subcommittee, the inpatient outpatient care subcommittee, and the cell collection and processing subcommittee. We needed to prioritize commercial products, prioritize clinical trials. Uh, we needed to assess our resources uh, and uh, develop workflows for smooth transitioning of patients from the inpatient to the outpatient setting and also workflows between apheresis, cell processing, and nursing. This led to the eventual creation of the City Safe Committee, which took on some of the roles of the Protocol Review Committee, and it is now in place to ensure that we have adequate resources to run the clinical trials and to also um, uh, choose between commercially available products and to actually track the approved projects and resources that have been utilized. We had to bring together a large team. team. These are some of the key stakeholders uh, at Yale. We hired a new pro CAR-T program manager, Katrina Bezak, and a CAR-T program educator, Kylie Cook, who have actually taken on uh, the work initiated by uh, Lisa and Kim and have played a major role in moving the program forward. We, had, uh, we identified MDs that required training, not just from the transplant and hematology department, but also MICU, ED, neurology, neuro-oncology, hospitalist team, and the HEMONC fellows. We identified nursing personnel that needed to be trained on NP7 and NP11 in SMILO, MICU emergency room, the CAR-T coordinators and navigators, the apheresis, cell processing team, pharmacy, financial team, social work, the EPIC team who put in place the order set flags and banners, the data managers who would collect and report to the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant and a quality improvement team. So this is the IC program organizational chart. And I'd like to outline that in parallel to the adult program, um, we also launched the pediatric CAR T cell program led by Dr. Nikita Shah, who is director of the transplant, pediatric transplant program. We have a clinical program uh, consisting of the MD physicians on the left. We have seven dedicated APRNs and PAs. We hired an outpatient um, transplant and CAR T APRN, and uh, we had uh, we have nursing representation from inpatient and outpatient units. We have representation from the cell therapy and processing lab with uh, medical director Diane Krauss, facility director Dr. Alexei Bersenev, and uh, stem cell specialist Donna Summers. And we have medical um, director of apheresis Dr. Jeannie Hendrickson and facility director Dr. Edward Snyder. So we realized that in addition to our institutional CAR-T training, we had to provide all the key Yale stakeholders REMS training. This stands for Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies. The FDA requires that drugs or biologics that have uh, anticipated greater risks, um, that the personnel be actually trained for REMS. So all in all, we trained 453 team members, and that included team transplant physicians, NICU, neuro-oncology, ED, hospitalist team, nursing, stem cell transplant coordinators, the SWAT team members, the stem cell lab members, 42 pharmacists, and we're currently expanding this to NP12 with education of 22 more RNs. 
So FACT is the foundation for accreditation of cellular therapy. It provides regulatory oversight. It's a network of experts and peers who develop evidence-based guidelines and standards that apply to cellular therapy processing, manufacturing, administration, and clinical use. Um, accreditation is voluntary, but it does demonstrate to patients, physicians, manufacturers, regulatory agencies, and insurance companies that the program is committed to a certain level of quality. And it is a requirement for center of excellence designation by insurance companies. Over 90% of transplant eligible programs hold FACT accreditation. There are some common FACT standards that we abide by, and then there are FACT standards for immune effector cell therapy alone for, that apply to programs only performing immune effector cell therapy. And then there are FACT JC standards that apply to programs who administer both stem cell therapy and immune effector cell therapy under the same umbrella. Out of 161 FACT accredited transplant programs in the United States, only 74 hold FACT immune effector cell therapy accreditation, 73 of them under the transplant uh, standards and one program accredited as a standalone immune effector cell therapy program under the IEC standards. So this is just an overview of transplant and cell therapy program history at Yale. We were doing autologous transplants for lymphoma starting in 1994, then allogeneic transplants in 97. The unrelated donor program started in 2000. Haploidentical transplants for lymphomas starting in 2016, and now we're offering CAR T cell therapy to lymphoma patients since 2019. The joint, from the time that the Joint Steering Committee was convened in January of 2018, we achieved certification to administer axicaptogen silalusil. We formalized the City Safe Committee. We collected the first commercial patient in December of 2018. We hired our program manager and achieved uh, uh, certification for Tisagen Leclusil in January of 2019. And at that time, we treated our first commercial patient. By July of 2019, we achieved FACT accreditation. So this is 2019 at a glance. We've treated 27 patients. 12 have been treated for lymphoma with commercial axicaptogen silalusil. Four were treated with tisagen leclusil. One lymphoma patient was treated on a phase one clinical protocol with an antibody coupled T cell receptor cells with rituxan. We treated 10 patients with multiple myeloma in a phase one clinical trial with anti BCMA messenger RNA CAR T cells. And we had two successful audits with Kaita Novartis. These are the outcomes of our patients treated with commercial products. Again, to remind you, these patients had uh, relapsed refractory disease and median survival expected uh, less than six months. 12 were treated with axicoptogene and four with tisagen leclusil. And you can see that the complete remission rate is about 50%. Here we have eight out of 16 patients in complete remission with a median follow-up of six and a half months. So the majority of those patients, based on currently available data from Zuma 1 and Juliet trials, are expected to maintain their remission. They were heavily pretreated. As you can see here, their CD3 absolute lymphocyte count is less than 10 times uh, that of normal patients. These are some of our metrics and toxicities post-CAR T infusion. Our median length of stay was about 20 days. The median CRS, the cytokine release syndrome onset was three days with duration of five days. The median onset of neurotoxicity was four days with the majority of cases resolving within a few days, but one patient uh, had the neurotoxicity that lasted for just over a month. And the number of outpatient visits up to day 100 since discharged uh, averaged 14. We did not see any grade three or four cytokine release syndrome, thankfully. We did see grade or, uh, one and two. And as expected and described in the literature, we saw about 26% grade three and four neurotoxicity. 
there was 18% tocilizumab use and 31% steroid use. I'll go into this quick uh, case presentation. Um, this is a 61-year-old patient with double hit lymphoma with rearrangements of CMYK and BCL-6. Uh, these double hit lymphomas are the poorest risk group of all large cell lymphomas. The patient uh, had uh, significant adenopathy at presentation, hypercalcemia, elevated LDH, was treated with standard upfront or CHOP chemotherapy, but did not achieve remission, was treated with RICE salvage chemotherapy, followed by high-dose beam chemotherapy and stem cell transplant. The patient maintained remission for a year and then recurred, was refractory to salvage chemotherapy, was refractory to splenic radiation, developed a large necrotic splenic mass with a fistula tract into the stomach, extension into the chest with a malignant pleural effusion, lower mediastinal adenopathy with esophageal compression and retroperitoneal disease. We admitted the patient in May for axicatagine silolusal. She received lymphodepletion with fludarabine cytoxin developed grade one cytokine release and grade four neurotoxicity, developed stress cardiomyopathy, required mechanical ventilation, had prolonged cytopenias despite antibiotics, developed strep mitis bacteremia and required prolonged TPN. As you can see, there was complete resolution of her mediastinal retroperitoneal disease and splenic disease. The fistula between the stomach and spleen is illustrated on the left, and that has closed on the right with only a small remaining focus of uptake that has remained stable to slightly improved on serial imaging. So this was really a success story for a patient who was as sick as she was. So what does the future hold for these um, CAR T-cell therapies? There are multiple trials that are looking at humanizing the SCFE to prevent immune rejection relapses. There are dual targeting CARs, targeting two, more than one antigen, for example, CD19 and 22, or CD19 and 20, to prevent antigen escape relapses. There are armored CARs with enhanced function, such as those secreting cytokines, and there are currently over 20 companies that are exploring gene editing, such as placement of the antigen-specific CAR under the transcriptional control of track locus. There are CARs with modulated ITAMs, and there are these supra CARs, smart universal programmable CARs, where you have a universal receptor expressed on the T cell, but then you have a tumor targeting SCFV adapter molecule that you can change and target multiple antigens. The activity of these supracars can be finely regulated via multiple mechanisms to limit overactivation. And very exciting is now the development of off-the-shelf allocar Ts, where you can disrupt TCR expression to reduce GVHD, or you can disrupt the beta-2 microglobulin locus to eliminate MHC1 expression. Given the explosion of technologies and the companies doing clinical trials, we decided it was time for us to create the immune effector cell therapy DART. We hired a clinical trial program manager, Alexandra Dormal, who has done an incredible job at keeping our program together and uh, building it. Along with us, we have members of the BMT and disease-specific teams in the DART members of cell processing, advanced cell therapy lab, CRSL project manager. We have clinical research nurse and a clinical research coordinator who we hired to expand the program. Data manager, Chris Fernandez, who's done an outstanding job because reporting these uh, toxicities in real time in the phase one trials is very important. These patients actually change their clinical status by the hour. And this is our portfolio. As you can see, there are many pending trials that are about to open in 2019, including some of the technologies I mentioned. So we will have a bispecific CD19, CD20 CAR. We will have a randomized trial comparing CAR T cell to autologous stem cell transplant in lymphoma. We will have trials with off-the-shelf allogeneic CAR T cells 
in both T-cell lymphoma and in renal cell carcinoma. I also wanted to outline a Yale IIT with TILS led by Dr. Michael Hurwitz. This is a phase two study that uh, will open this year, uh, looking at um, autologous, uh, engineered autologous cells expressing bispecific CD20 and CD19 in refractory lymphomas. And as you can see, bottom right corner, this is in tandem, this technology is in tandem, where you're encoding two cars on the same chimeric protein using a single vector. There are also cars that are co-administered or these bisystronic vectors where you can express two different cars on the same cell. This particular trial is in tandem. And then, as I mentioned, we will have these uh, CRISPR trials that are anti-CD70 allo CRISPR-Cas9 engineered T cells in both uh, T and B cell lymphoma and in renal cell carcinoma. This is a, a representation of the one-step multiplex editing to produce these allocar T cells. So TCR expression in the center is disrupted using CRISPR-Cas9 targeting the track locus to prevent GVHD. The anti-CD70 car construct is then inserted into the track locus by homology-directed repair using an AAV template. And then to enhance persistence, the MHC1 expression is eliminated by disrupting the beta-2 microglobulin gene. And finally, we have a collaboration with Dr. Sidi Chen from the uh, Department of Genetics here, looking at his technology with a dual car knock-in and immune checkpoint gene knockout, the so-called Kiko, Kiko cells. And we hope to develop our own IIT here in B-cell malignancies, targeting anti-CD19 and CD20 uh, and disrupting PD-1. What else is new in the CARL-T world? There's a lot more going on. We are identifying new targets. So CS1 and GPRC5D in multiple myeloma, ROR1 in CLL, CD70 in renal cell carcinoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Claudin 18.2 in gastric and pancreatic adenocarcinoma. There's going to be a revolution in the conditioning that we use pre-CARL-T, going a chemoradiation free route, and antibody-based. There are NK CAR T cells that may play a good uh, a role in uh, solid tumors. And there are also non-viral gene delivery methods with many companies uh, currently looking at this technology. So I just wanted to give a big thank you to our patients and their families for having the courage to undergo this type of therapy with these expected side effects and for trusting us with their lives. Um, I'd like to thank the administration, led by Dr. Charlie Fuchs, uh, and all of the support they gave to the building of the program. I'd like to thank all the physicians involved, Dr. Stuart Seropian, the director of the Bone Marrow Transplant Program, Dr. Steve Gore, who is leading the, the City Safe Committee, uh, Dr. Nikita Shah from Pediatrics, Dr. Diane Krauss and the Advanced Cell Therapy Lab, Dr. Bersenev and the Cell Therapy Processing Team, Dr. Jeannie Hendrickson and the Apheresis Team, Dr. Baring from Neuro-Oncology, Dr. Herlopian Epilepsy Team, Peter Marshall and John Siner from MICU, Bonnie Rothberg from ECC, the uh, Emergency Department Team, and um, again, uh, just to go back to our program managers, uh, I cannot thank Lisa Barbarota and Kim Severino enough for laying the foundations for the program. And now Katrina and Alexandra moving both the CAR-T commercial uh, program and the clinical trial program forward. Catherine Pratt, who's our coordinator, Melanie Champion, who's our quality manager, um, and EPIC legal team, and also our marketing team. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. So we have time for questions. There is everybody stunned. <laughs> I think the one thing, the one question I have, anything in the pipeline for leukemia? Myeloid is very absent in your list of CAR-Ts. So actually, um, 
It's not. We are planning to have a trial in leukemia. I may have uh, overlooked that uh, there, but we have an AML trial coming up where we have tumor-associated anti- where um, the T cells are stimulated with uh, ABCs that are um, that are um, uh, prepped with these PEP mixes with these different tumor-associated antigens. So that trial will take place in post-leukemia relapse patients and will randomize patients who are negative for minimal residual disease uh, to either that or observation. And, um, you know, the, the, as, as you well know, um, it is difficult with, uh, to target AML with CAR T-cell therapy, but I think uh, we have more trials uh, in the pipeline that are coming through TOMA for AML with uh, CRISPR technologies. talk and, and what you've put together is amazing. Uh, one thing I'm wondering is how we're paying for this. So uh, uh, one, are, are these covered by insurance, the, the products that are commercially available? And two, you know, I can, this is an amazing list if we want to do investigator-initiated trials, you know, and we're going to put these patients in our very full hospital and we're going to do all this work. Do we, do we have uh, monies to do this? How is that working? So uh, the products themselves are very expensive. Um, uh, they're somewhere at the time from three hundred seventy-five to four hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, and that we're getting paid for that separately. But actual reimbursement for taking care of the patients and covering their uh, MICU stay should they need it is very low. Uh, I mean that's uh, projected to improve to some extent, but I don't think we will necessarily get paid 100% for doing this. So I think we need to do things uh, internally, such as uh, as we have started to do now that we um, have treated the first 30 patients, we're trying to move the conditioning to the outpatient setting. We're trying to manage them in the postcar t period more outpatient in, in our day hospital. And then, you know, the hope is that in the future, uh, these technologies will become cheaper, so um, they will not be as centralized. Uh, some, at least one institution has done this uh, point of care using the Milteni uh, Prodigy device, and the cost uh, doing that is only a few thousand dollars. So I think that this is going to change once more products are approved and there's competition. And, you know, for IITs, uh, that aspect of it is, is extremely difficult because um, even the institutions who started this work, like UPenn and uh, the Fred Hutch, ultimately needed to uh, collaborate with pharma because it's so difficult to run these, these trials in large scale. So, so it's very difficult, but we are trying to obtain some find it funding to at least start our first IIT internally. And we're always looking for collaborators, and that's why this was a good opportunity to, to present here to see if there are internal people who might have an interest in developing our internal phase one portfolio. Um, yes, thank you. Um, you mentioned 30 patients and 64 uh, in the slide. And um, my question is, uh, what are you uh, projecting for, say, the next five years? Yeah, so um, already we exceeded our expectations for the first year. Um, I think um, we're currently projecting about 40 patients this year, just based on um, how many patients we've treated so far. But I think, as you saw, we have a long list of pending trials, and I think that number is is going to be much higher uh, one thing to know is that these therapies have extended now beyond lymphoma, and we are treating such a large multiple myeloma population here that once we start those, and, and also when they get the therapies get approved for adult B cell ALL, which will happen in the near future, I think that it's not unreasonable to think that the number is going might approach a hundred. Okay. That's very impressive, Iris, I must say, as a uh, really a neat program. How far along are you in the pancreas study and what targets are you using in pancreas cancer? So for, so for, for pancreas, we haven't started 
the study here yet, so we hope to start it also in 2020. The target for that is a PSCA. There are um, a phase one trials that have been run elsewhere uh, with uh, pancreatic cancer, mesothelioma, uh, ovarian cancer that I've seen, and also prostate cancer. Um, again, they all have treated very few patients so far. It's very challenging to apply these technologies to solid tumors. We have to deal with a microenvironment, um, and we haven't really found a good way to, to get to that. And maybe the NK cells or even off-the-shelf NK cells we will have might be able to, uh, to help us target that solid tumor population. But uh, so far, we only have the breast cancer trial that's open here. We don't have the pancreatic yet. I just wanted to augment the answer to Roy about the finances. We had our first uh, look at the first year of experience, and honestly, uh, most places that have launched CAR have taken a economic bloodbath that the hospital, hospital was a little bit prepared for uh, through really very aggressive um, work on our contracting people, and it's really a lot of case-by-case -case management. And we've had a fair number of Medicare and Medicaid patients that were treated uh, at least in terms of direct costs, we're doing extraordinarily well, and I think everybody couldn't be happier. Uh, it's not to say it's not a challenge, particularly how to pay for the IITs, but the insurance, uh, you know, I think the uh, coverage is going to become more uniform and clear, which hopefully will include the opportunity to to treat um, with phase ones as if they were commercial drugs, although we still need to obviously have the venture capital to, to build the the IAT products. But I, I really just have to augment what Ira said about the great teamwork and very careful planning uh, that Rogerio and Kathy Lyons really started. It's been a really hugely successful rollout. And um, you know, I think it, knock on wood, really couldn't have been any better. So then thanks to Iris for heading it up. Well, let's thank uh, both of our speakers, Dr. Lim thank and um, Dr. Isuki.